On the 4th of June 1940, probably one of the most amazing stories from World War II came to a successful conclusion. Operation Dynamo, the evacuation of British and French forces from Dunkirk, from right under the very noses of the victorious Nazis. And it remains one of the greatest ever evacuations in military history. For nine crucial days at the end of May and the beginning of June 1940, the history of Britain and the history of the world hang in the balance. This is the story of Operation Dynamo. So I'm Chris Green, the history chap. I've got a degree in history. Um, I've, I've been passionate ever since I first spoke about Henry VIII when I was a little boy. When I was at school, I wrote a book all about Cecil Rhodes and, and the British Empire in Africa. Um, and yeah, I've got my degree, been on archaeological digs, battlefield tours, you know, and I live and breathe history. And I love sharing the stories from history with people like you. Hope you enjoy this one. So let's put the events quickly into context. On the 1st of September 1939, Germany invaded Poland and the British and French issued an ultimatum that they needed to withdraw. They didn't. And on the 3rd of September, Britain and France declared war on Germany. British troops, uh, called the British Expeditionary Force, the BEF, were sent to France to counter a potential invasion. But through the winter, nothing happened. And this whole period was termed the Phony War. The French and the 390,000 men of the British uh, and Canadian units waited. And in the spring, the Germans turned their attention to the north and invaded and occupied uh, Denmark and Norway. And still the BEF waited. And then on the 10th of May 1940, the Nazis released their Blitzkrieg, a lightning two-pronged attack. Uh, the first through the Low Countries, Holland and Belgium, and then through the Ardennes Forest of, of Luxembourg, breaking the French line at Sedan. And on that very same day, the 10th of May, Winston Churchill became British Prime Minister. And <laughs> what a first day at the office. The German forces swept west and they reached the English Channel at Abbeville on the uh, mouth of the River Somme on the 20th of May. It had taken them just 10 days to advance further than they had done in the whole four years of the First World War. The Allied forces had now been split, with the, the British and French and Belgians in the north being pushed into a smaller and smaller pocket with their backs to the English Channel. On the 15th of May, Holland surrendered. On the 25th of May, Boulogne surrendered. And the following day, the 26th of May, Calais was captured. Cut off from their allies, surrounded, backs to the sea, and now with only one way out, the port of Dunkirk. The British were looking at a historic disaster. And on that same day that Calais fell, the 26th of May, Operation Dynamo to bring the British army home was put into action. But the British High Command, the Imperial General's staff, doubted it would be effective, and they, they thought that, gosh, if they got a quarter of their army back to Britain, it would be a success. Dynamo was organised by Vice Admiral Bertram Ramsey, Ramsey, based in a command centre underneath Dover Castle, cut into the White Cliffs. And in fact, you can visit those tunnels today. It's run by English Heritage. And contrary to the film Finest Hour, uh, it was not named after an electric dynamo. It was just simply a code word. Uh, that, that, uh, that's certainly uh, according to English heritage. And as they look after Dover Castle and the wartime tunnels, I, I guess, you know, they should know. With Ramsay overseeing the overall operation from Dover, he sent uh, Captain William Tennant to Dunkirk to act as, as beach master and coordinate the evacuation on the ground. When Tennant got there, he found that bombing from the German Luftwaffe had damaged the, the docks and made them almost inoperable. But on the east side, ran, there was a mole, like a breakwater, which ran about 1.3 kilometres out into the sea. And that mole was topped by a wooden boardwalk, which was about the width of four men. And Tennant decided to use the mole as a makeshift harbour, with ships pulling up alongside the breakwater. 
The only other option for was lifting men from the beaches to the north of the town. Uh, but there was a major problem with this. The beach had a very gentle incline. So even at high tide, the naval destroyers were still stuck, well, over a mile offshore. And that, that's why you get those, those, famous, uh, those famous photos of soldiers waiting in long lines, wading out to the, to the waiting ships. The solution would be to use smaller craft to go closer to the shore. Back on the 14th of May, the BBC had announced that owners of all self-propelled pleasure craft, 30 to 100 foot, uh, needed to send details to the Admiralty within 14 days. And now on the 26th of, uh, 26th of May, the Admiralty swung into action. First and foremost, they, they sent uh, Royal Navy and Merchant Naval ships to Dunkirk, the big ships to go alongside the Mole to try and rescue as many men as possible and to wait offshore so that the men could line up in the, on the beaches and come out, to the, uh, come out to the boats. Whilst at the same time, they started to assemble a flotilla of those small boats that had been requisitioned. The evacuation started slowly. On the first day, the 27th of May, just 8,000 men were ferried to safety. But slowly, momentum built. Uh, two days later, 29th of May, the Isle of Man packet uh, boat, a ferry from the Isle of Man service uh, called the SS Tinwald, rescued double the number of men rescued on the first day just by herself. She actually rescued 15,000 men on one day. And then on the 31st of May, the little ships started to arrive. 850 of them crossing the channel from Sheerness and Ramsgate. Motorboats, uh, Thames fireboats like the Massey Shore, fishing boats, uh, RNLI lifeboats, Ramsgate Sea Scouts boat, it was called the Montague Waller, uh, sailing barges from the Thames, Thames tugboats. And they were drawn from all along the south coast of England and up into East Anglia, you know, Shoreham, New Haven, Exeter, Penzance in Cornwall. As I said earlier, you know, initially the idea was that they would, they would go in close to the beach and merely ferry men back out to the waiting destroyers. But as the week progressed, many bypassed those larger vessels and took their wards all the way back to the safety of England. And in some cases, you know, their boats were so weighed down that they had to avoid any larger ships in the English Channel because the wake of those ships would swamp their boats. The, the sea was almost up to the edge of that so many men in. Here's one myth from Dunkirk that the little ships rescued all the troops from Dunkirk. They rescued a hell of a lot. They rescued the little ships are responsible for taking 99,000 men off the beaches at Dunkirk. But 239,000 boarded the destroyers and the ferries like the Tinwald that were moored alongside the Mole. You know, but all the time they were waiting. Veteran uh, Harry, Lee, uh, Harry Lee Dugmore, you know, he recalls waiting two whole days on that mole, exposed, waiting for air attacks from the Luftwaffe, for, waiting for safety. HMS Sabre, a destroyer commissioned during the dying days of the First World War, made nine crossings back and forward, bringing troops home. HMS Codrington made eight crossings. HMS Malcolm, captained by the 41-year-old Thomas Halsey, who earlier in his career had, had played for the uh, Egyptian cricket team, <laughs> He also made eight crossings in his destroyer. Back on the 28th of May, HMS Wakeful, another First World War survivor, rescued 640 troops and headed back home. In fact, there were so many men on board, all on the decks, that it was a chance that they would actually capsize and the captain ordered them down into the bowels of the boat to, to create a balance. And HMS Wakeful, having survived 27 bombing attacks to and from Dunkirk, was on her way home. And as they moved out into the English Channel in the pitch black night, a German e-boat, or tor torpedo boat, captained by a Lieutenant Zimmermann, moved out from behind a flashing boy where he'd been disguised, uh, blinded by the light, and fired two torpedoes at HMS Wakeful. One hit the forward boiler room, and the explosion broke the destroyer in two. And there in the darkness, HMS Grafton, raced to the scene to pick up the survivors, only to be sunk by a German U-boat herself. Of the 640 soldiers who were on HMS Wakeful, just two survived. Wakeful and Grafton were, Grafton were two of the six destroyers lost 
rescuing the troops from Dunkirk. In total, over 200 of the 850 vessels that went to Dunkirk were lost. Uh, they included civilian ships like the Montague Waller, you know, formerly of the Ramsgate Sea Scouts, that went down. The Thames Sailing Barge, Ethel Everard, was lost. Um, and alongside those Royal Naval losses, four ships from the Belgium Navy were lost and 21 from the French Navy were, were lost as well. Another one of the myths of Dunkirk was that uh, all the little ships were crewed by plucky civilians. You know, we've all seen the black and white films. There was a, a well-spoken captain, uh, a cockney, and, and then some sort of wily old Scot. That was the standard British black and white uh, movies. That, that was all the war movies, wasn't it? Um, or am I being a bit naughty? But uh, most, of the, many, most of the civilian ships were actually crewed by Royal Navy ratings. But some of the little boats were crewed, crewed by brave civilians. And this is my favourite story. It's about a pleasure craft called the Sundowner. Sundowner made its way from Ramsgate over to Dun Dunkirk under its owner, Charles Lightholler, uh, and his son, and, uh, and a sea scout named Gerald Ashcroft. And they, there they proceeded to actually rescue 130 troops and brought them back to, to England. I don't know if the name Charles Lightoller rings any bells to any of you historians, especially your maritime historians, or to anyone who's seen a film with Leonardo and Kate in it. Because Charles Lightoller was the second officer on the Titanic. He, he was the most senior officer to survive. And I find it incredible how history threads events and people together over the years. You know, I wonder if there was any searching for redemption in his bravery going all the way to Dunkirk on his boat and rescuing all those men. Having said that, how would you feel <laughs> as, a, as, a, as a soldier if you found out that your boat to, 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 uh, to safety was being captained by an officer off the Titanic? I, I bet you couldn't wait to see Ramsgate. You couldn't get there soon enough. At 10.50pm on the 2nd of June, Tenant from Dunkirk sent... Ramsey an almost unbelievable message and it said simply BEF evacuated. They had got all of the troops that were trapped in Dunkirk back to England. In spite of that looming disaster Ramsey's operation had lifted overall 100, well, it lifted 198,000 men of the British Expeditionary Force from the jaws of defeat. And over the next two days, on Churchill's orders, the ships returned to Dunkirk to pick up even more French troops. Operation Dynamo finally ended on the 4th of June. In total, 338,000 Allied soldiers were rescued in nine days. 198,000 British, 140,000 French and Belgian. It ranks as the biggest military evacuation in history. 338,000 men in just over a week. Yeah, that's a staggering figure. It's, it's half the number of the troops that were landed on the beaches of Normandy on D-Day. And that operation took years to plan. Rem remember, Operation Dynamo only started on the 27th. So it was ordered on the 26th of May. It started in earnest on the 27th of May. Just 17 days beforehand, the Germans had been on their side of the border. As I said, uh, 140,000 French troops uh, were rescued. Uh, most were rerouted via Britain back to France to continue the fight, but to no avail. Ten days after Dynamo had finished, Paris was captured by the Germans. And on the 22nd of June, the French signed an armistice. People look at Dynamo and they, they think it rescued all the British troops that were in France. It, it didn't. To the south, there were still British units fighting alongside the French. And for the two weeks after the fall of Paris, two further and forgotten naval evacuations, Operation Cycle and Operation Aerial, rescued over 190,000 British, Canadian, uh, French, Polish, Czech forces from ports all along the west coast of France, uh, Le Havre, Cherbourg, Brest. Some never made it home. 10,000 men of the 51st Highland Division were cut off and forced to surrender, and they spent the next five years in captivity. Films of Dunkirk have tended to downplay the role of the RAF in the success of Dynamo. 
But during Operation Dynamo, the RAF actually flew 3,000 sorties and bombing raids. And they shot, some, shot down something like 200 Luftwaffe planes for over 100 of their own losses. In fact, interestingly, it was a, actually a higher kill rate that the RAF inflicted on the Luftwaffe than they did during the Battle of Britain. Part of the misconception was that due to the RAF trying to intercept bombers coming towards Dunkirk and indeed on their way back from Dunkirk, the troops on the beaches actually rarely saw the RAF above them, just German planes that got through. And there is another reason that the RAF weren't always seen and we'll come on to that in a while, okay? One of the enduring questions about Dunkirk is why the Germans just didn't finish off the BEF and the French forces there. And Hitler famously ordered his panzers to halt on the 24th of May. And when they were finally allowed to advance again three days later, they met some stiff resistance and once again Hitler ordered them to disengage. Why? Well, one view, the traditional view, is, is Hitler didn't want to humiliate the British and that the British would realise they were beaten and were going to sue for peace and he wanted peace with the British, didn't want to fight them. You know, after Dunkirk, the British Army had virtually no tanks or artillery to oppose any German invasion and just look how quickly they'd cut through France and the Low Countries. So common sense, in Hitler's mind, would suggest that British would have a peace deal, whether they were defeated at Dunkirk or allowed to get off the beaches. If that was his belief, it was misguided. He had not counted on the, the stubborn nature of Churchill, or indeed the galvanising effect of this near defeat, followed by the miracle of the little ships, would actually have on the British people. Maybe he simply miscalculated that, I think the, the British, in sort of a warped way, I think us British, we quite enjoy being bloody-minded and sticking two fingers up to the world. So being stuck all by ourselves was, was you know, was, yeah, we were happy. Alternatively, Hitler might have wanted to conserve his military strength for the next phase of the battle. You know, us British, we, we focus our minds, when we talk of Dunkirk, we focus to the north and the trapped army at Dunkirk. But if you were either the French army and if you were the Hitler and the German army, there was still the whole of France to the south to take on. So why waste your troops fighting the British around Dunkirk when they were obviously finished, when you could conserve your energy to sweep south? Um, there was an, another thing is that the, the Germans might have felt overstretched. You know, they'd pushed so far, so fast, so quickly through France that there was a danger they themselves could get cut off by a counterattack. In fact, the, the British and French had mounted a, a limited counterattack at, at Arras, which had nearly broken through the German lines and would have therefore encircled the panzers. So, you know, why risk that again? And what we do know is that Hermann Göring, the commander of the Luftwaffe, confidently told his Führer that his planes could finish off the BEF without any army help. So, um, I, yeah, I guess Hitler probably, probably said, well then, be my guest, get on with it. And of course, um, as I just described, actually the German losses were, were quite high over Dunkirk and he did not uh, finish the job that the army could have done. And finally, how about this one? You know, we all hold beliefs and we make decisions based upon our beliefs and our experiences. And, you know, whether just because we've experienced an event once means it's always going to happen that way again is, is a completely open question, isn't it? Hitler had experienced the mud of Flanders in World War I and he didn't actually want to see his panzers bogged down in that same mud and become sitting targets. So if Hermann Göring could finish the job off with his bombers and save the panzers from being stuck in the mire of the mud, so much the better. British could be bombed to the negotiating table whilst the panzers could turn south and spearhead phase two of the offensive towards Paris. In other respects, Operation Dynamo was what you could deem lucky. You know, apart from Hitler's, Hitler's reluctance to press home the attack, the Germans also had to use seven valuable divisions fighting French forces who'd held out in Lille. They held out till the 31st of May. What might have happened if those seven divisions had been available in front of Dunkirk? Would Hitler have restrained them? And we spoke about the aerial assault on Dunkirk and its failure earlier. The evacuation had the, the good fortune of English Channel summer weather. In other words, poor weather. On the, the 30th and the 31st of May, thick cloud cover 
prevented the German Luftwaffe attacks, obviously also prevented any RAF planes flying over. So again, British troops didn't see a lot of RAF planes for those two days. Interestingly, 120,000 120, men were rescued on those two days of cloud cover where the Luftwaffe couldn't attack. That's uh, nearly a third of all the men that were rescued during Operation Dynamo. 11,000 British soldiers lay dead in France. 35,000, one in 10 of all the BEF were prisoners of war. All of the army's heavy equipment, tanks, artillery, armored cars, trucks, millions of tons of ammunition and weapons were lost. And 35,000 French soldiers who bravely held the perimeter so the evacuation could take place finally surrendered and were, were sent into captivity by the Germans. Many of the little ships are still sailing today, including Charles Lighthollers, Sundowner. And if you've, if you've ever, you can even go on a trip on the Thames sailing barge called the Greta. She's based in Whitstable in Kent and she sails out into the Thames estuary, although I think she might be in dry dock at the moment. But there you go, the owners of, uh, the owners who just got a bit of free advertising based out of Whitstable. Have a look. And I recently saw um, in the papers, back in March I think it was, recently saw that one of the little ships has actually been converted into a houseboat. <laughs> and was on the market for £300,000. Yeah, what a story those walls and that boat could tell, hey? There's no disguising just what a disaster had befallen the British Army in less than a month in France. On the day that Dynamo ended, 4th of June, Churchill addressed the House of Commons and delivered his stirring Fight Them on the Beaches speech. And he needed to. You know, in that speech, Churchill reminded his listeners that, uh, quote, we must be very careful not to assign to this deliverance the attributes of a victory. Wars are not won by evacuations. But that, in many respects, is just why Dunkirk needed to be played up. That Dunkirk spirit was, we're all in it together. That's why the myth of the little ships became so powerful. That we're all in it together. It wasn't just the, the fly boys in the RAF or the Royal Navy saving all the troops. Everyone was there. The Charles Lighthollers, the Sea Scout ship from Ramsgate, you know, fishing trawlers from RNLI boats from Cornwall and Devon, crewed by plucky civilians, you know, the posh captain, the Cockney and the Wiley Scott, um, all going across doing their bit to keep Britain in the war. Four years and two days after Operation Dynamo finished, Allied troops returned to France on the beaches of Normandy. 6th of June, 1944, the D-Day landings. Now, D-Day fascinates me because, I mean, the planning, the coordinating of all the crossings, they called it Piccadilly Circus in the middle of the channel, where they're getting all the ships and sending them in the right directions to the right beaches. The decoy armies that were set up in East Anglia so that German reconnaissance planes could believe there was a whole army in East Anglia commanded by General Patton, and they were like, they were plastic dummies and blow up bl inflatable tanks and things. Uh, County air espionage through the double agent uh, Garbo, the bombing of German supply routes, the artificial harbours, the Mulberry harbours, and the, the fuel pipelines, uh, Pluto under the sea. I mean, it's f amazing project management. It took months, years of planning. Operation Dynamo was cobbled together with a few, with a, a week's notice and actioned over just nine days. And it was all done without the material and manpower support of the United States. Churchill was right, evacuations don't win wars. But the, the miracle of Dunkirk kept Britain in the game. It meant the game wasn't over. And the British people pulling together believed their Prime Minister when he said there would be no surrender. And they'd fight on to victory. And eventually the new world would come to support the old world. How different the world would be if Operation Dynamo had failed. During those nine days, the fate of the world and history hung in the balance. So there you go, Operation Dynamo, finished 4th of June 1940. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, pop over to my website, thehistorychat.com, and sign up so that you get more of these stories. I, I, do, I do little weekly updates uh, each week with little videos, but I do some bigger talks. One's in the pipeline, we've got Gordon of Khartoum uh, coming up. And I've also got one on Raidwald, the warrior king who was buried at Sutton Hoo Burial Mound. That's from Dark Ages England. Uh, fascinating story. So pop over to thehistorychap.com, sign up, and I will see you very, very soon. Thanks for joining me today. Keep safe.